In this program, one of the most dynamic, deadly battlegrounds of all, the world's rivers. An Alaskan river, freezing, powerful and unpredictable. Most of the year, there are no predators or prey to interrupt its flow. But for a few weeks every summer, the Alaskan River is the stage for a titanic struggle between the Pacific salmon and the grizzly bear. To win, both have to read the river's moods. How deep it is, how strong the currents, where there's turbulence. For bear and salmon, all these factors will dictate the outcome of the fight. Pacific salmon are fish on a mission, heading hundreds of kilometers upriver to breed against the current all the way. But these adults are creatures of the sea. For them, fresh water is slow poison. From the second they enter the battleground, the river starts to eat their flesh away. It's a race against time to reach their destination before the river's poison kills them. And they face many other dangers on the way, from raging waterfalls to bears. For the river is both the salmon's deadly enemy and friend. Churning with air bubbles, it isn't always what it seems. The strong current will slow the salmon down, but white water can help it too. The most turbulent areas can't flow as fast. So though it looks like suicide, the river's boiling rapids can offer an easier ride. But battling against the current is exhausting, and the salmon need a break. Further upstream, the river shows its softer side, a clear, calm pool. The fish can rest here, but they can't stay long. Time isn't on their side. And fresh water is not the only threat. Though if the bear can see the fish, the fish can also see the bear. These crystal clear shallows are on the salmon's side. They can easily dodge a lumbering bear. Further upstream, and the river switches loyalties the battleground presents the salmon with the biggest hurdle yet. Tons of water pounding downwards and accelerating as it falls, no fish can swim through that. The only answer is to leave the water and jump. A mature Pacific salmon can leap four meters into the air. but they are not built to fly. The older, smarter bears are waiting. They have seen it all before. Once in the air, the salmon are committed to their path. No chance to twist and turn their way out of trouble. The fickle river now delivers them straight into waiting jaws. But a bear can also smell a salmon. Churning water bubbles carry scent up to the surface and betrays the fish. This time it's all over before the salmon sees the threat. Weakened, 
Wounded survivors struggle on upstream towards the spawning grounds, and their heroic battle finally reaches its end. They've hit the deadline and managed to breed before the river has killed them. But now it's the salmon who make their mark on the battleground. Their rotting bodies release nutrients into the water, helping the river to support new life. And so the drama ends. Until next year. Spring in southern England. And another winding river. Clear, clean waters, rich in oxygen. All seems serene. But this idyllic scene conceals another battleground, a hidden drama waiting to unfold, with the mayfly in the central role. She's in an even tighter corner than the salmon, defenceless and surrounded by a host of enemies hell-bent on her destruction. Can she fulfill her destiny? And what part will the river play in directing her fate? The waterway is calm. The air is still. Beneath the surface, all is tranquil too. A peaceful haven for the mayfly nymph. But nearby lurks an expert hunter, a brown trout. He's waiting for some shift in battleground conditions to give him the edge. Rougher waters, perhaps, where the mayfly nymph might lose her grip. For now, fortune flows her way. She eats, molts and develops in the safety of the riverbed, burrowing into the gravel out of sight of enemies. No chance yet for the trout to tackle its prey. The river has sheltered the growing nymph for two years now. But it's experiencing changes of its own. Swollen by early summer rains, it is about to turn the tables and become an ideal hunting ground for trout. By May, the nymph is fully grown. The sun warms up the water, telling her it's time to leave the safety of the riverbed. This is the opportunity her enemy is waiting for. Once at the surface, the mayfly prepares to leave her old life behind. A magical transformation into a creature of the air. As she sheds her skin, she leaves behind her gills. If she goes underwater now, she'll drown. The river, once her sanctuary, now becomes a deadly trap. Its surface tension could easily drag her down. In this limbo between air and water, every second counts. Exposed like this, she's easy prey. Other mayflies are snapped up all around. Our heroine, though, finally takes off, ready to launch her mission as the ultimate speed dater. She and thousands like her have just a couple of days to find a mate. Then they must embrace the water surface once more to lay their eggs.
The battleground is now a killing zone. But our mayfly has made it through. Once back on the water, the river is once again her friend. The surface tension now helps support her body as she lays her eggs. She has fulfilled her destiny, but after two long years preparing for this moment, her life in the sun is short. Less than two days after she first spread her wings, the mayfly is already dead. The river has been friend and foe, and now it will harbour another mayfly swarm. Here in Europe, shifting seasons change the river's mood. This is a battleground in motion, never easy to predict. With hidden currents, churning rapids, crystal shallows, sudden depths. The river's character can alter in a heartbeat. Those who live here must adapt if they are to survive. This river is home to the minnow. And its arch enemy, a lightning aerial attacker, the kingfisher. For this bird, the stakes are high. Succeed or starve. No problem when the water's calm and clear. The keen-eyed kingfisher can see right to the riverbed. But seasons shift, creating a different scenario. In winter, the water may even freeze. The kingfisher can't hunt at all. And the river gives the minnow sanctuary beneath a shield of ice. Snow turns to rain. Raindrops and ripples break the river surface. It doesn't matter to the minnow what the weather's like up top. But the kingfisher can't focus on his target. All he can do is sit out the bad weather and wait. Bad weather turns to worse. The river swells from placid stream to churning flood. The water deepens and gets muddy. Once again, the battleground gives the minnows the edge. In murky water, they're extremely difficult to spot, and they rest deep down near the river bed, well out of reach. As the rain stops, a tantalizing glimpse of prey. Time for the kingfisher to seize the day? But the river's now too deep, and the kingfisher can only dive to 50 centimetres. He can look, but he can't touch. The fisher king seems to have lost his crown. But this is Europe. And it isn't long before the weather and the river changes once again. In the calm after the storm, the water level starts to drop. And now, the battleground favours the kingfisher. Clear, shallow, gently flowing waters and hunter and hunted's fortunes are reversed.
The fickle river seals the minnow's fate and the kingfisher regains his crown. Across the world though, there are fish that would eat him alive. South America, the Orinoco River and a very different battleground. It's the third largest river system on the planet with more than 200 tributaries. A water world. In the wet season, parts of the Orinoco swell to more than 20 kilometers across. But in the dry season, it shrinks to just a fraction of that size. Here the river's whim dictates who lives and who dies. It's now July, height of the wet season. And thriving here in all this water is a fish with a fearsome reputation, the red-bellied piranha. Appetite with attitude. In this vast river, finding food is hard. But once piranhas do home in, it's death by a thousand bites. It's August, and the battleground begins to change. The water level starts to drop. The river shrinks, abandoning the floodplains, forcing the piranha to retreat. The major river channels shrivel and divide up into pools. And now the piranhas feel the heat. As the water in the pools get warmer, oxygen levels drop. Some fish cope well with little oxygen, but not piranhas. And the slightest sign of weakness seals their fate. The river turns piranhas into cannibals. And it plays into other hunters' hands as well. The crowded pools and feeble fish mean happy hour for larger predators. And the river hasn't finished with them yet. The isolated pools turn into liquid mud, a death sentence. The river, it seems, has the last word on being a big fish in a small pond. But the ever-changing cycle of the battleground continues. The dry season breaks. The river eventually swells to its full glory once again. In some channels, piranhas have survived. Back in the river's favor, they are free to kill again. Africa's Namib Desert. Its barren dunes are sculpted by wind and baked by the blistering sun. During the day, temperatures soar to 40 degrees Celsius. And cover is almost impossible to find. But by night, the nature of this sweltering battleground changes dramatically. As the sun dips behind the horizon and the burning sands lose their heat, it reveals a more forgiving side. A hunter emerges. A trapdoor spider. He takes advantage of the cool night air to feed on small insects and beetles. But it's a race against time. At dawn, the battleground will show its fiery face again. As his world becomes a scorching sand pit, the spider must find shade. And here, the battleground is on his side. 
The spider shifts loose grains of sand to build a nest, held together with strands of silk. In this camouflaged bunker, he's cool and concealed. But not for long. Out on the dunes, a female wasp scours the sand for prey. She's a specialized spider assassin, armed with a paralyzing sting. Mere camouflage is no defense. The battleground betrays the spider now. In this open arena, his faint scent wafts unobstructed on the breeze. Amazingly, the wasp detects even the slightest whiff through sensory hairs on her legs. Homing in on her target, she begins to dig. The spider's now in double trouble, exposed to both the wasp and the battleground's searing heat. Its jaws versus sting in this battle of reflexes, and the wasp is faster on the draw. Paralyzed by the sting, she buries the spider in a makeshift larder, saving him as a juicy morsel for later. But will the wasp always inflict this gruesome fate? If we rewind the clock, perhaps the spider can manipulate the combat zone, using its ups and downs to give himself the edge. In places, blasting winds have piled the sand 300 meters high, creating the highest dunes on Earth. What if the spider builds his nest right at the crest? The wasp can still sniff him out. So there'll still be a showdown. But this time, could the spider take evasive action? He hurls himself from the top of the dune, flipping into a wheel. With nothing to obstruct his course, he makes a dizzy dash for freedom. Back at the top, the wasp is left chasing the scent of her vanished meal. This time, the battleground provides a free ride and the spider makes a great escape. In a head-to-head, -head, the wasp wins every time. But by exploiting the battleground, the stunt spider's radical tactics can alter the odds. Surprisingly, our second story about desert battlegrounds begins in water, out in the ocean. Adult fur seals spend most of their lives at sea, fishing the rich currents from Namibia to the Cape. But once a year, they're forced to come ashore to give birth. The nearest dry land is the desert coastline of Namibia. This is a world of two extremes where scorching desert sands fall steeply into icy South Atlantic waters. When the seals arrive, this no-man's land between desert and sea turns into a dramatic combat zone. The noisy colony draws unwelcome attention from inland. Hyenas and jackals are normally shy scavengers, barely scraping a living from the desert sands. But this is a rare opportunity for a bonanza of fresh meat. The stage is set. So will this rugged battleground help predator or prey? 
The shore banked steeply up into the dunes, and the hyenas used this vantage point to pinpoint their potential victims. Unattended, newborn pups. Surely there couldn't be a softer target. But the situation is not as clear cut as it seems. The battleground can suddenly switch character. Offshore, the ocean currents change. Within minutes, the sea breeze turns into a gale. The seals can sit out the sandblasting winds because of their thick fur and blubber. But their enemies can't stand it. And with visibility down to less than two meters, they beat a retreat. Thanks to the battleground, the seals win some respite. But the wind drops just as suddenly. The battleground switches allegiance once again. Now, it's the seals' worst nightmare. They're designed for icy waters, not the desert sun. Without the cooling wind, the pup's dark coats absorb the scorching heat. It seems the battleground itself is on the attack. As the ground becomes a furnace, mother seals are torn between protecting their pups and the cool water. Finally, they can't stand it anymore. They head towards the sea, some dragging their pups with them in a desperate bid to save them. Shadowed by the hungry jackals. Other females are driven by heat exhaustion to the sea, abandoning their pups. Alone and exposed at the edge of the desert, the pups are sitting ducks. And timid scavengers now show a bolder side. The weakened pups have no defense against a wave of hungry mouths. Tens of thousands of seals breed here, and most pups do survive. In just a few weeks, they'll be old enough to swim, leaving this unkind desert battleground behind. We were feeling the heat of the world's driest combat zones. Next, the hottest part of North America, the Sonora Desert. This is a different kind of desert battleground. Instead of open space, there's cover. Thanks to moisture-laden winds blowing in from the Pacific, some hardy plants can flourish here. And in this spiky war zone, these plants are a major player in the battle between predator and prey. The Harris Hawk, one of the most powerful hunters in the bird world. Pursuing a pack rat, another skilled desert survivor. Taking advantage of the battlefield terrain, the rat slips under a prickly pear. The hawk tries to follow, but for him, these thorny shrubs are off limits. These sharp spines can do more than ruffle his precious feathers. 
they can inflict serious injury. For now, the rat's safe in his barbed fortress. But on this battlefield, the hawk has an ally too. The saguaro cactus, an armored giant found nowhere else on earth. It can live for 200 years and grow 12 meters high. And in the battle between hawk and rat, the saguaro is on the hunter's side. Because these hawks do something no other birds do. They hunt in packs. And for their strategy to work, they need to take the high ground. The team takes up position in the heart of the combat zone. Using the cacti as lookout posts, they scour the countryside. These spines are no problem. The hawk's feet are tough as old boots. Time to engage the enemy. First, the advance guard swoops low to flush out the rat from his hiding place. While up above, the lookouts monitor their every move. Now, with three against one, the prickly pear can't hide him. In a desperate dash for freedom, he breaks through enemy lines. On the ground, he has the advantage of speed. But now the flight patrol takes over. On this unique battleground, these hawks have developed a unique battle plan. They have joined forces to secure a victory and share a meal. Our final story takes place on shifting sands, and for that, we return to Africa's Namib Desert. Unlike the Sonora, this arid landscape offers few weapons to use in a fight. But here, you can manipulate the battleground's main ingredient, sand. Introducing the sand lizard, and Sidewinder Snake. When it comes to surviving in this hot spot, these cold-blooded adversaries are evenly matched. The lizard keeps its feet clear of the scalding sand. The snake also keeps cool by limiting its body contact with the ground, which gives it speed. And when it comes to hunting lizards in this wide open arena, speed is vital to a kill. But this fickle battleground is on the move as well. As a storm approaches, millions of grains of sand take to the air. The battlefield begins to shift. Just at the critical moment, the sand dune collapses under its own weight.
Taking advantage of this twist of fate, the lizard seeks shelter in the loose, dry sand. But the battleground spits it back out. With winds now gusting to over 100 kilometers an hour, everything has to take cover. The only shelter is in the small pockets of grass at the base of the dunes. In the confusion, predator and prey are thrown together again. With less chance of a landslide on level terrain, the snake sets up an ambush. Scooping out sand with its coils, it begins to bury itself. Until only its eyes can still be seen. After the storm, the lizard has gained an appetite, unaware that he's on the menu too. Now the snake uses its sandy layer to play its ace, wriggling its tail to mimic a tasty grub. This time, the snake wins the day. But life here is a constant gamble. When the heat is on across the planet's desert battlegrounds, the ever-shifting sands decide the fate of all.